Excellent. Okay, I think we'll get going. Welcome, everyone, to this discussion and report on the Arms Control and Regional Security Oral History Project. My name is Christian Osterman, and I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, which includes our Nuclear Proliferation International History Project. We're delighted that so many of you are, are joining us for a discussion of the results of this multi year uh, research project on the arms control and regional security process in the Middle East. Particularly delighted to welcome Ambassador Adam Scheinman, Dr. Han Kane, and Dr. Hannah Nata, uh, who will um, uh, be speaking with us this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. As many of you know, the arms control and regional security working group, ACRES, was formed as an outcome of the 1991 Madrid conference, along with four other multilateral working groups that were intended to support the bilateral negotiations between Israel on the one hand and the Palestinians, Palestinians Jordan, and Syria on the other. Between 1991 and 1995, 13 Arab states, Israel, a Palestinian delegation, and a number of extra regional states and entities, including the United States, participated in over 40 acres meetings, which focus on both conceptual and operational confidence building and arms control measures. The idea for this research project goes back almost a decade to 2013, when there seemed to be real prospects for a serious dialogue on Middle East regional arms control. That possibility demanded a look back at the, <clears throat> at the only other such process, the ACRES working groups process 20 years earlier. A good number of things had been written on the talks, on the working groups, not in the least by some of the delegates themselves who, um, who took uh, time to give their own perspective on those unprecedented meetings. However, there had never been a single comprehensive account stock taking based on these recollections of all parties involved. Um, this plus the fact there, there were no official records uh, that were taken during the Acres talks made it challenging to put together a comprehensive chronology and assessment. About three years ago, we were approached by the Carnegie Corporation of New York to see if we would be interested in working with the team from the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, CNS, Dr. Han Kane and Dr. Hananate, to fill this gap in our understanding of the Middle East arms control and regional security uh, process. Much of, uh, over the past two decades, NPHP uh, has tried to expand the archival and documentary database on nuclear proliferation issues. Um, and so this project was really a great fit for us, even more so as the project would involve a series of oral history interviews, climaxing in a critical oral history conference a special kind of group eyewitness historical interrogation that we at the center have had some experience in conducting. We spent the next couple of months discussing best practices for conducting oral history interviews, arranging travel to the Middle East and elsewhere, and collecting documents for the History and Public Policy Program's digital archive. We put together a game plan for a efficient one-year project and the grant request was promptly approved in the winter of 2020, just when the pandemic hit. So with the outbreak of the pandemic, we had to move to a plan B. And so over the next two years, the project team led by uh, Hannah and Ren conducted around 40 oral history interviews, often uh, forced us to move to a virtual format instead of meeting in person. Uh, with ACRES delegates from Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Palestine, and the United States, as well as with representatives from states that, that supported the process, including Canada, India, the Netherlands, and Turkey. Now, 33 of those interview transcripts are available on our redesigned Digital Archive website, easily and freely accessible at digitalarchive.org. Again, that address is digitalarchive.org. Uh, if you log on, right on the front page, you'll see links to uh, all of the ACRES materials. In November 2021, a year ago, we brought together 20 of those ACRES delegates for a critical oral history conference to revisit, if not to relive, um, the ACRES process. 
The critical oral history method uh, works at the nexus of oral histories and document-based scholarship, rather than relying just on the recollections of the former Acres participants alone. We engage them in a conversation with each other, stimulated by and grounded in a curated collection of documents. You will hear much more about the findings from this conference and the larger uh, project during Hen and Hannah's presentations. But you can also read the transcript, which is now available on the Acres collection page in the Digital Archive. Again, that archive at digitalarchive.org is freely accessible. In addition to the interviews and Critical Oral History Conference, the project involved the most comprehensive document collection on Acres to date. Though access to most archives was severely limited during the COVID pandemic and archives are only slowly beginning to open now, we were able to contact and request some materials from the George Bush and the Clinton Presidential Libraries. And we were also able to access several private archival collections. And these documents, along with hopefully others in the future, are being added to the digital archive um, collections. I'd like to express some words of gratitude to everyone involved here in, in making this project a reality, despite the many obstacles that we faced over the last couple of years. First and foremost, warm thanks to uh, Dr. Hannah Nata and Han Kane, our friends and colleagues at CNS, outstanding experts who were, were also fine human beings that we really enjoyed partnering with. They, in turn, were supported by a team at CNS and our gratitude to the uh, larger CNS team as well. We're also very grateful to Jenny Grummel and Michael Yaffe, who supported this project in a variety of ways from beginning to end. A special thank you, of course, goes to the over 40 former diplomats and officials who agreed to be interviewed for this oral history project or joined us in the Critical Oral History Conference some of whom I believe are in the audience today. Thank you for sharing your experiences, insights, and recollections so candidly so that we can learn from them. Finally, thanks to my team at the Wilson Center, which has supported this project in so many ways over the past two and a half years, especially Kian Byrne, helped to manage much of the archival administrative elements of the project, and the program's deputy director, Charles Krauss, who led the redesign of our digital archive and has worked tirelessly uh, so it would be ready just in time for this launch. Um, I should also express thanks to Ambassador Scheinman, of course, who has agreed to, to join us and will, I think, round out in wonderful ways um, this panel. And thanks are due to the Carnegie Corporation of New York that really made this project um, possible. We've worked, we've been supported by the Carnegie Corporation for well over a decade, decade uh, with our uh, nuclear history work. And uh, I can only say that that partnership is also a really uh, wonderful and productive one. Let me introduce our speakers um, this afternoon, this morning. And we will start with our two lead investigators, Dr. Hannah Nate and Dr. Hen Kane. Then we are privileged uh, to have Ambassador Adam Scheinman with us to provide some comments and reflections and to perhaps look at some of the lessons and current um, issues uh, on the subject. After these presentations, uh, we will open the discussion to questions and comments from the audience to our three panelists. Hannah, I think we're starting with you, right? No, we are starting um, with Anne. We're starting with, okay, then yes. I'll, then, then let me introduce um, uh, Hen first. Um, our project lead on the Acres Oral History Project is Dr. Hen Kane. Uh, she's the founder of the Middle East Next Generation Arms Control Network and the program director for the Middle East Non-Proliferation Program at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies at Monterey. In addition, she serves as project lead for the Middle East Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone Project at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Throughout her career as nonproliferation scholar and expert, Dr. Kane has held research positions at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University 
and at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. She was an advisor at the Jepson Center for Counterterrorism at Tufts University and the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Dr. Kane also served as an adjunct professor with the National Defense University, and before joining the Center of Nonproliferation Studies, she worked with CSIS uh, as well. She's um, Her research uh, primarily focuses on arms control and security issues in the Middle East, focusing particularly on the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction in the region. Her work has been published through different periodicals and institutions, including the Bulletins of Atomic Scientists and the Middle East Institute. I'd like to thank Hen for all of her efforts in bringing this project to life and her incredible work and commitment, along with Hannah, to this to seeing this project through. Would not exist without her, and we're, as I said at the outset, very grateful to have gotten to work so closely with her over the past several years and gotten to know her in the course of it. Zoom room is all yours. And thank you. Thank you, Christian. And uh, thank you also, Kian and the Wilson team for this two years of really valuable partnership. Um, and we also want to thank again to the Carnegie Corporation for supporting the project and especially Karim Kamel for the insight of uh, agreeing to uh, to support it and the Hannah for leading it because Hannah has been the leader of it for the last two years. Some, uh, so some of the Acres negotiators uh, actually, as mentioned, are that were interviewed uh, are joined us today uh, on the call and I wanted both to acknowledge them as well as thank them and uh, we welcome their remarks uh, or questions during the Q&A. Uh, I also want to note that as opposed to uh, policy papers and analysis that we are used uh, in a custom at CNS, this is the project is oral history one. And as such, as such, all the insights that Hannah and I uh, are going to mention during the event are based on our interviews. Uh, I will cover three topics uh, of our research in my por portion of the event. The first is the inception of ACRES. What were the international and regional circumstances that facilitate its creation? and its unique formation. The second one is the objective of the various players in the negotiations. And the third one is the unique format of ACRES. So starting with the inception of ACRES, there really was an agreement uh, among all those that were interviewed that the convergence of events at the international as well as regional levels created the opportune moment in history that allowed the establishment of the Arms Control and Regional Security or ACRES Working Group. On the international level, the US just demonstrated in the Gulf War its capacity to mobilize the world and to carry out a military operation that won and ended the war within 100 hours. Uh, in addition, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, opened up new opportunities. The US felt it could support the initiate and, and initiate arms control and non proliferation measures both on the bilateral as well as multilateral levels, including, for example, the 1994 uh, grid framework with the DPRK, South Korea, uh, so, sorry, South Africa just gave up its nuclear weapons, and the Chemical Weapon Convention was concluded, uh, in 1993, and also there was progress on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty negotiations. On the regional level, also there was a lot of impact of the Gulf War so, and, and other um, international events that were going on. So first, the collapse of the Soviet Union it was a, a huge geostrategic impact on the region. On one end, it allowed for progress and new initiatives since there was no Cold War paralysis anymore on the international levels. But on the regional levels, there was a lot of impact uh, of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, from a regional balance power standpoint. So the Arab, practically most of the Arab countries lost their main protectors as well, protector as well as arms supplier. Uh, the defeat of Iraq uh, during the Gulf War also changed the balance, balance of power in the region that impacted the ability of countries and willingness to an interest to negotiate on arms control issues. First, uh, it eliminated for Israel a significant threat, allowing it to take more risks, but also it also fragmented further the Arab world. Uh, not only Arab states joined the US coalition against another country, Arab country, since both Arafat and Jordan supported Iraq, they lost support from the Saudis and other, mainly political and financial support. And those two uh, entities, so Jordan and so the Palestinians, uh, really needed the US for financial aid and political support. More specifically, the discovery of the Iraqi weapon of mass destruction 
uh, during the, the Gulf War and afterward, coupled with Saddam Hussein's threat to use chemical weapons, highlighted the regional proliferation security concerns. So really all this, both international as well as regional events really uh, culminated to this opportune moment. Uh, the, US, the US decisive victory in the first Gulf Wars also was perceived in the US as an opportunity for restructuring and retransforming the region to make progress in promoting a more stable and secure region. Uh, some non-US interview also, interviewees also mentioned the promise, a promise that was made by the US uh, to its allied Arab states that uh, joined the US coalition in the Gulf War that the US will make a serious push to resolve the Arab-Israeli dispute when Kuwait war was over. Uh, US started a concent con concentrated efforts to implement these ideas uh, following the Gulf War with the US Secretary of State, especially James Baker, personal involvement backed by, backed by President Bush and Brent Scarford uh, to get a, the parties to the Madrid conference. Uh, and that's what the idea was really to have a big one peace conference that will follow up with uh, a peace process. Uh, the Madrid, Madrid peace conference took place in October 1991 uh, with 14 delegations from the region participating. And that was really unprecedented uh, moment uh, in the history of the region. It was the first time that countries in the region met on a regional basis, uh, both Israelis and Arabs. The Madrid conference inaugurated really double track process on the bilateral process. There was a three ongoing negotiation, Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Jordanian, and Israeli-Syrian peace negotiations. And the other track was the multilateral track, which uh, and with Israeli-Arab negotiate, negotiations. Um, really one, just to illustrate, one extra regional diplomat commented that that was a hard unheard of diplomatic achievement to get them all together. And it was a tectonic shift in the Middle East. Uh, the decision of who to invite to, the, to participate in the Madrid uh, conference really emanated from the US vision of structuring the Middle East post Gulf War. Iran, Iraq, and Libya were not invited to the Madrid or to the multilateral wor working groups that were established in Madrid. There was an agreement among those that were invited and, and interviewed that uh, including them would have been a bridge too far at that point, uh, given the regional realities at the time. At the same time, there was also recognition of their importance. And some of the interviews, interviewee mentioned that there was always a vision at some point uh, to the vision was to broaden the participation to include them, or at least to create the opportunity for them to, in, to join. Syria and Lebanon, while were invited, uh, choose not to participate in the multilaterals, and they perceive the multilaterals as a mean to normalize, normalize Israel before their bilateral conflict with Israel was resolved, was settled. So they they practically opt to the bilaterals uh, and not to bilateral uh, threat negotiations with Israel and did not join the multilaterals. So how the, the multilaterals, how they were created, they really followed the Madrid conference, and there was a decision there on the five working groups that were established in, the, in that track. The five topics that were covered were economic development, water resources and management, environment, refugees, and arms control and regional security acres. Uh, these topics were identified as the most vital one and the most controversial ones in the region. The idea from the US perspective was uh, really to promote four aspects. First is to bring, why to create those multilaterals. So first was to bring the other Arabs that were not involved in bilateral peace negotiating in, negotiation into the process to really find a way to engage them and make them participants rather than just kind of observers sitting on the sidelines and keeping butting and criticizing. And this is a quote. Uh, second, uh, the long-term objective of the multilaterals from the US standpoints was really to identify a vision, something of a post-conflict Middle East and to jumpstart the original process down the road after the bilateral agreements agreement uh, concluded. The third is to discuss some of the issues that were seen as regional issues that could not be resolved only bilaterally. And the fourth one is the multilaterals were aimed at identifying and diverting the or delivering, sorry, uh, the dividends of the peace that might encourage all sides on the bilateral level to make some concession and accommodation 
in order to, uh, well, if they see the dividends, the possible dividends of this. Uh, as noted, there was a very strong and unique relationship between the multilaterals and the bilateral tracks, uh, which were important, to, which are important to understand to fully really understand the progress or lack of uh, in acres. So if I'm speaking about the, really the relationship in the, with the bilateral track, from the US and most of the other countries in the region, the, from the very start, the multilaterals were established to support the bilaterals. And they were also subordinate to making progress in the bilaterals, which meant that we, we always really stayed one step behind the bilaterals. Similarly, that was also the case for Israel and Jordan. For Israel, the priority by far was the bilateral. Israel was very suspicious of negotiating not bilaterally one-on-one -on -one with other regional states. And also they did not trust others being involved in the process. So Israel uh, agreed to the multilateral concept due to mainly US pressure. And over, but over time, they did see the multilateral, multilateral as beneficial in creating two things. A, atmosphere, which will make it easier for regional state to engage with it but also to make compromises. And according to one Israeli that we interviewed, it was clear that such process will involve very painful decision on the Israeli side, particularly on territories and the Palestinian issues on the bilateral level. And what they tried to ensure is that the process would not merely yield concession on the Israeli side, but also involve in return an historical process of reconciliation of Arabs, uh, the Arab world with Israel. Jordan, both because of its regional isolation post Gulf War and because they had, at least at the beginning, their delegation was composed as a Palestinian Jordanian delegation. Also held that the bilaterals were central to look on the, and they looked really on the multilateral in what concept and idea could start implementing, but how they would support and strengthen the bilateral talks. Uh, they really did not believe that ACOS could take place as a standalone process and without the political process of reconciliation that was really uh, has been done in the bilateral mainly. All the Gulf uh, similar, very similar, all the Gulf state priority were also to the bilateral, primarily the Israeli-Palestinian track and the resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli question. And really the other issues for them were really perceived as, mo as more or less marginal. Uh, our Palestinian interview even held that the multilateral multilateral tracks actually undermined the bilateral text because it rewarded Israel and uh, to be able, they were able to sit with uh, other Arabs prior to the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In contrast to most of those uh, actors, Egypt on the other hand was really the least sensitive to the multilateral. Uh, because it has already peace agreement with Israel, they did not have a central role to play in the bilateral track. So for them, the multilaterals was where they could play a role and Acres for them was the main committee where they were interested in. So I will move now to the objective of the various countries in the region on the process. For the US, there were four main objectives. The first one was to focus on the sources of instability in the region and identify different kinds of mechanisms that could reduce the risk and conflict of escalation. The second one uh, was a create a long-term incremental process that build up personal relationship that may be able to transfer a shape relationship among regional states over time. The third one is the really proof of concept to show to regional countries that there were ways to cooperate in the region and to make progress towards peace and security. And the fourth one was within acres, especially is to the overreaching to get to identify an overreaching political goal and a shared vision for the region and where we, where we want to go and to work in phases towards it. For Egypt, its perception of itself really at the time informed their objective of acres. So really, um, and here I'm quoting as a traditionalist from developing world and a non-aligned world, Egypt found its natural concentra concentration on disarmament. And what, when we were told is like, we didn't speak about regional security by, by Egyptian, we didn't speak about regional security, we didn't really care about uh, arms control, we really were concentrating and wanted to achieve disarmament. On the regional level, Egypt really adopted a policy of parity in obligation, mainly related to the NPT. And as far as Egypt was concerned, uh, you cannot achieve regional security framework in the Middle East while Israel has nuclear capabilities. Israel was not Egypt only concerned at the time. They were also concerned by other creeping uh, proliferation trends in the region 
as demonstrated in that point or previous in the early 90s by Iraq. So they really believe that that will require a framework for regional security, uh, but that cannot be achieved without Israel disarmament. Egypt also has two other indirect objectives in the process. The first one is to define and ensure its role within the entire peace process. As I mentioned, because the spotlight was not on Egypt on the bilateral, given that Egypt already had a, agreement, a peace agreement with Israel, Israel relied on, sorry, Egypt relied on its experience in the multilateral, different multilateral disarmament forum, as well as experience in negotiating with Israel is an experience that none of the other Arabs had to really assume a leading role within ACRES. The second indirect objective in the process for Egypt was uh, to integrate back into the Arab world uh, after being outcasted following its 1979 peace treaty with Israel. Now moving to Israel, what Israel's objectives were. So Israel's decision to go to Madrid and to the multilaterals really was driven by its dependency and pressure from the US at the time. Israel's main goal within ACRES was to prevent the process of damaging what it perceived its core interests. Because Israel perceived the Egyptian all purpose of acres is to disarm it and wanted to prevent, the, so they really wanted to prevent what they call the slippery slope, where it joined the process and have no control where it develops or which, dem which demands it might be forced to accept given the automatic uh, minority that they will find themselves compared to the number of Arab states. So it tried really to ease some of those concerns by promoting structure and opportunity for regional security arrangements. So really broader the conversation rather than only Israeli nuclear uh, capabilities or disarmament. Jordan objective in ACRES one is extension of their Palestinian bilateral tracks with Israel. Because Jordan was a front line uh, with Israel, its objection was to complete the delineation of the demarcation of their borders and establish security and economic relationship with Israel and, the, and Palestine. Uh, it supported the principal and final aim, which was weapon of mass destruction free zone, but in contrast to Egypt that put a, a great premium on uh, Israel nuclear disarmament with Acre, within acres, Jordan held that the NPT and all the other treaties are means to an end and not an end in itself. The goal state really assigned acres and the multilaterals in general as the old political objective, which is supposed to support the bilateral tracks and the peace settlements. And otherwise any agreement discussed would be in a vacuum. So let me end, go to my third topic, which really was what the format of the talk. Because of the sensitivity of Acres work, the Acres Working Group, the decision that the US and Soviet decision was that the US and the Soviet Union and later Russia uh, were the co-sponsor of the peace process as a whole, and also because of the sensitivity of ACRES, arms control, uh, and regional security in particular, they will also be the co-chairs or co-gavel orders of ACRES. As such, they took on themselves to negotiate, facilitate uh, rules of procedure, agenda, the issue culture summaries, and decision made uh, by the working group. The US also saw itself as the main driver behind the process through guiding and facilitating, while the Russian as co-chairs because of the domestic situation and with the class collapse of the Soviet Union, really did not uh, engage very actively in the leading role. role. Yet regional uh, interviewer really held that it was very important to have the, both of them, US and Russia as co-chairs because it's demonstrated the unity and objective and support of the process. Uh, more about the format of the negotiation, it was also agreed that proceeding uh, of group meetings will be confidential, so no official record were kept. It uh, also uh, agreed that the, inf and, uh, sorry, the informal um, process was really important because of the deep crisis of confidence uh, between among countries in the region, but also concerned that anything that countries uh, or the delegates will say or agree on could easily work against them afterwards. So because ACRES uh, participant also included Israel and another 13 Arab states to prevent a situation where Israel will find itself in automatic minority, uh, the decision was also adopted that every effort will be made to obtain consensus. So all uh, decisions were made by consensus. Another negotiation format that was adopted along the way was to split the, dis the topic discussed in the working group into two baskets. Uh, there were two boxes. The first one was a conceptual basket, and the other one was operational basket. 
the conceptual basket for focused on creating general principle and norms to guide regional security, such a long-term objective, declaratory measures, verification, and the definition of the region for arms control and regional security purposes. The operational baskets on the other hand focus on technical CBM, so confidence building measures in four agreed area that were led by extra regional states. So one, the first topic was maritime issues and that was led by Canada. Exchange of military information and prior notification was led by Turkey. The establishment of regional communication network was led by Netherlands and the establishment, establishing a regional security center was led by Australia. The idea of the division between those two baskets was to work more closely between plenaries because plenaries was, were uh, really uh, time separated between them and there was really, really not work done between them until the baskets were established, but also to try and untie or untangle the technical and operational issues from the political ones so they could progress independently. But to address, to address the Egyptian concern of progress on the operational basket that went ahead from the conceptual basket, as well as concern by other countries, uh, are the other Arab countries that the multilaterals are going too fast compared to the bilaterals, the idea of nothing is agreed unless everything is agreed was also adopted. And as such, really all the measures that we agreed, and Hannah will speak about them later on, were kept aside until final agreement on all issues uh, were to achieve. Last but not least, related to the format of uh, the acres was the educational format of the negotiation. It was agreed that uh, the initial meetings will have, have a seminar type format. It was aimed at addressing several concerns. The first one is the listening and learning model really help addressing concern of some, most of the other Arab countries that were not, uh, that did not have yet really formal relations with Israel, is that they were not really comfortable speaking with Israel and neg negotiate directly. So listening and learning model was really helpful in that sense. The second one is the capacity building to address the significant discrepancy among participants country of their level of knowledge and expertise and really create shared foundation in terms of understanding of what we're trying to do and what the tools are available in order to do that. The third uh, of the model really allowed to start with a broad vision of the ultimate goal, which included the establishment of weapon of mass destruction free zone in the region, and then work from a very bottom how to achieve it. And then the fourth one was really a point to demonstrate how two sides and many of the examples of the, of the academic parts of it or the education part of it was from the Soviet US or from Europe. So how really hostile parties can engage and negotiate and really take, take a talk on difficult issue and how that can work out. So with that, uh, the education also uh, turned really relatively fast to a field trips. Uh, we really, which was really the idea was to understand the various options for creating building measure, but also to observe facilities that related to verification and monitoring, which made the discussion more concrete. So with that, I will pass the screen to Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Hen, for this, this uh, great context um, uh, setting. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Hannah Nata, the other uh, co-director of the project and really the uh, investigative lead and and Hannah as uh, we've gotten to know her she's really sort of a one-woman machine when it comes to interviews and research and and really uh, a driving force behind this entire project she is a senior research associate at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, where she focuses on arms control and security issues involving Russia and the Middle East before joining the Vienna Center, she was a senior political officer at the Schreik Group, an NGO that studies track to mediation and informal diplomacy in the Middle East, and a senior non-resident scholar at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Uh, Dr. Nata has held a number of research positions throughout her career, including a visiting researcher at the Institute of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Carnegie Moscow Center in Russia, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Syria-Iraq office in Lebanon, and at the International Strategic 
International Institute for Strategic Studies, Middle East office in Bahrain. Her research centers primarily on the intersections of arms control and security issues between Russia, the West, and the Middle East, regularly lecturing at the Middlebury Institute and publishing articles through a myriad, uh, myriad newspapers and periodicals, including the Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Policy. And has also been a wonderful partner on the Acres Project. As I've said, she's kind of a, a one-woman machine in getting the research done that needs to be done for this project. And it's uh, a, really a pleasure to uh, leave, give, give the Zoom room to her. Zoom room is yours, Hannah. Thank you so much, Christian. And I want to join you and Ken in thanking the various parties uh, that made this project possible and also the 40 uh, former diplomats and officials we interviewed, some of whom are in the Zoom room as I see it. Um, so Ken talked you through the inception of Acres, uh, the objectives of the different parties, as well as the format um, of, of Acres, the process design. I want to take you through the perceived successes and achievements of the process as seen by those who participated in it the problems and failures that afflicted Acres and sort of led to uh, or contributed to its demise over time, and then reflect a little bit on the lessons from Acres um, for efforts at enhancing arms control and regional security today. So if we start with sort of the, the achievements and successes in the, in the process, again, not as seen by us as researchers, but as articulated through these oral history interviews by those who directly participated, the first achievement that is mentioned is that Acres essentially served as a proof of concept that a serious arms control and regional security process in the Middle East region is indeed possible. Uh, as one Egyptian whom we interviewed noted, he uses Acres as an example even nowadays to basically show that at one point the Middle East almost made it, the Middle East almost uh, came together. Um, the second achievement that is being noted is, and this is something that Ken already alluded to, the cultivation of relationship that happened in Acres and the building of trust among key parties. This is seen as one of the great intangible achievements of Acres, showing that a civilized conversation in the region between uh, antagonistic parties is possible, a humanizing of the other side that took place in this process. I would say this was acknowledged in the interviews, even among those most skeptical of any sort of tangible achievements, lasting achievements of Acres. Though I would say that in the interviews, some would praise the, the trust building uh, more than others. I would say that the American diplomats who participated emphasized it more, whereas among the Israeli and Egyptian interviews, for instance, you had somewhat greater, greater skepticism and also uh, some pointing to the limitations in trust building. For instance, noting that the Saudi delegation kept at a distance from the Israeli delegation pretty much throughout the process with, with a few exceptions. Uh, I do want to note sort of generally that perhaps one of the greatest um, sort of distinct contributions of this oral history project is that it the, the, the interviews uh, generated a lot of uh, insights into the personal dynamics of the process. We collected a lot of anecdotes in these interviews that you can sort of read in the digital archive if you want to study the individual interviews, but they are also reflected in this long study that we published today. So uh, parties are reminiscing on, on flights that they took to go to various meetings, like the Israeli delegation going from Cairo to the Doha plenary via Saudi airspace and feeling that that was a historic moment. The sharing of meals, the chats during coffee breaks, also examples of sort of animosity and unpleasant encounters. All of this is collected in this, in this oral history. A third um, achievement that is being noted is that Acres afforded a learning opportunity to the various parties and a learning opportunity in various ways. First of all, the learning about the other side and what is and isn't possible really to achieve, but then also a historical learning opportunity. Ken noted the seminar style approach that was initially chosen in Acres the learning about arms control experiences in other regions, in the US Soviet context, but also in, in the European theater. So there was learning there, but the learning had wider ripple effects. It wasn't just those who came to the Acres meetings. There was also a feeling that that learning was taken back to capitals, that it contributed to either the 
really the formation of relevant bureaucracies and sort of a cater of, of, of individuals with expertise on arms control for those countries that, that didn't have the historical focus on those issues where arms control wasn't high on the agenda or that it contributed to the further development of such a cater for those countries that were already more advanced like uh, Israel, Egypt and, and Jordan. The fourth uh, achievement that is being noted is that ACRES really enabled a regionalization of a conversation on, on arms control and regional security, and also to a certain extent, a demystification of, of arms control. And it nurtured a sense that really regional security is about a lot, a lot more than just the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I think in terms of regionalizing the, the process or a sense of, of the process, moving the process into the region was considered really important. So the fifth and sixth plenaries and acres took place in Doha and in Tunis, respectively, in 1994. Um, I already noted that the Israeli delegation found that to be particularly historic to go to those countries at that time for the process. To some degree, the United States saw this as a sort of progress in the right direction uh, in the sense of accepting Israel in the region. Though I would note that it also comes out in the interviews that perhaps the Egyptians and some of the other Arabs were a bit more subdued in, in, in sort of um, reflecting on the importance of those regional meetings that they felt it was perhaps symbolically important, but that substantively uh, not much changed in the negotiations and some were even concerned that it would give sort of the appearance of business as usual or normalizing with Israel when actually there remains a lot of discrepancy in the negotiation. Another achievement that was being noted in the interviews is that Acres generated some positive spillover to other sort of conflict, uh, conflict areas in the region, that it contributed positively to Jordanian-Israeli talks on a, on a peace treaty, which was concluded in 1994. But for instance, that it also um, positively influenced Israeli-Turkish uh, strategic cooperation at the time. And then finally, last but not least, and this is something Ken already mentioned, of course, Acres actually produced tangible results, agreements in the operational basket, which were operationally finalized, though they were never formally adopted, giving the set aside and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. I will just quickly list those achievements. Um, um, agreements on a uh, regional security center in Jordan and affiliated institutions in Qatar and Tunisia, a communications network, procedures for pre-notification of certain military activities, a number of maritime CBMs, such as a draft agreement on search and rescue and prevention of incidents at sea. And, you know, in, in even though the, those things were never formally adopted for implementation, in one of my interviews, and I just give this as an example, a diplomat insinuated that perhaps these agreements had a tangible impact regardless. He quoted an Israeli admiral who stated at one of the sort of final meetings on maritime CBMs, and I quote this Israeli admiral, when I go home, I'm going to instruct all of my commanding officers of ship and aircraft to read this thing and comply with it. I'm not saying it's official, I'm not asking any of you to do the same thing. I'm just telling you that if one of your vessels comes across one of ours and you choose to use these signals, our guys will know what you're talking about. So this uh, gives you sort of an example of how these um, CBMs might have resonated, notwithstanding uh, failure to adopt them. I wanna go quickly into the problems and, and fault lines uh, that afflicted Acres. And I think the most important problem was that the divergent objectives with which parties entered the process, and Ken has uh, illustrated those, could ultimately not be bridged over time, but they produced these sort of protracted fault lines. The first fault line was that between arms control and regional security and the question of sequencing and emphasis in that regard. There was an Israeli view that you work in the operational basket on CBMs over time. That is a better reflection of how naturally work on regional security and arms control should progress. You generate a stake in the process for smaller states. That stood opposed to an Egyptian view, which essentially said, we're okay going along with this basket split, operational and conceptual, as long as there will be a serious discussion on arms control and nuclear arms control. But we will not let those other working groups or the operational basket to proceed too much sort of far ahead. 
And of course, the nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Maxime was important to bring along the Egyptians on the question of that basket split. But when, from Egypt's perspective, the disconnect between how these baskets were advancing became too great, Egypt tried to take control, uh, tried to take back control over the process, which was essentially ensuring that no further progress in the operational basket would become possible. And this is something you play, see play out in 1995, and we detail that in the study. The other fault line was that between the bilateral and the multilateral tracks. Ken mentioned different countries had different ideas about the relationship between those two tracks, the priority among them. And uh, I would say that Jordan and the smaller Arab states in particular also grew uncomfortable with the sort of the feeling that the multilaterals and, and acres specifically were advancing ahead of the bilaterals. As a result of these fault lines, what you have emerging in our oral history interviews is different narratives as to what is really to be blamed for the demise of acres. There's not one narrative, unsurprisingly, and I'm happy to sort of go further into that if there's interest. There's additional problems that afflicted the process that were raised in the interviews. I'll just sort of quickly run through them. One was a feeling, some point to it, that the US lost interest in the process over time, especially by the Clinton administration, and that that sort of lesser uh, US um, sort of taking the lead and driving things forward took some of the energy out of acres. Though, of course, Israeli and Egyptian delegates would disagree as to what they believe the US should have done to keep the process alive. Some interviewers also pointed to a, an asymmetry in capacity and expertise, relevant expertise among the different regional delegations um, that some you know, had sort of few knowledge um, and were not so well versed in the concepts of arms control, um, of course, with the great exception of, of Egypt and, and, and Jordan, and that that also caused you know, certain problems in, in the process. And then finally, uh, intra-Arab differences were pointed at, uh, not just in, with regards to capacity and expertise, but also in terms of preferences and interests. Though again, this is an area where you'll find different narratives emerging from the interviews. The Egyptians felt that most of the Arabs were happy to defer to Egypt and to Egypt's leadership in the process most of the time, though they would acknowledge some occasional competition with Jordan, whose expertise though was very much valued and, and respected. But among some of the Israeli and American participants, there was a sense that some of the Arabs grew a bit frustrated with Egypt over time and with the Egyptian insistence on discussing nuclear arms control. Uh, then there were some intra-Arab differences even sort of beyond Egypt and at a more subtle level, some pointed, for instance, to, to a Qatari-Saudi rivalry that, that played out in Acres. Perhaps I'll just end quickly by reflecting on some of the lessons that emerged from the interviews concrete lessons that can be instructive for, for a regional security process today. Um, so Ken already mentioned these various procedural decisions that were taken in Agers, the seminar type approach, the baskets, the consensus rule, the informal process. Uh, you know, I will not go through the sort of participants' reflections on all of those, but if you look at our study, you will see uh, how various parties reflected on those, on those various procedural decisions and what were the sort of pros and cons in terms of participation, one lesson that emerged is that one should aim for inclusivity in participation in such a process to the extent that it's possible. Indeed, uh, most interviews acknowledge that having Iran, Iraq, or Libya in the process at the time was a quote unquote bridge too far. But at the same time, there was a realization from the beginning that not having these parties at the table would pose an obstacle in the process and that what should aim for inclusivity uh, to the extent that it's possible. Another important lesson is that personalities really matter. So a theme that you have emerging throughout the interviews is that the, the key parties all brought their quote unquote A teams to the table. So if you hear the various delegations talking about their counterparts, there's a lot of high praise, how good the American delegation was, what fine expertise there was in the Egyptian delegation, in the Israeli delegation, the Jordanian delegation. So there was really a feeling that there were very serious um, people in this process and that really mattered for the quality of, of the talks. The rotation of locations was also seen to matter, especially the moving of the process 
into the region from sort of initially having these plenaries in Washington and Moscow intermittently and then moving them in the region because there was a feeling that it gave a higher stake to the regional parties themselves, they, that, they, that the, they would be made to care more about the process and its success. Uh, unsurprisingly, on this sort of big substantive question, whether one should um, try as a lesson from Acres to uh, tackle negotiation substance in a comprehensive fashion and sort of address all the issues from the beginning, or start with the low hanging fruits with this incremental approach, there was no one sort of consensus emerging from those interviews, different individuals had different views on that question, which is perhaps unsurprising, but there was a sort of um, general agreement that incrementalism is no panacea in a process like that if there's absence of political will ultimately to bridge the key differences. And in this instance, the key difference being seen as that between focusing on arms control or regional security between the uh, Egyptian and Israeli delegation. And the final sort of lesson is on outside leverage and regional input. There was a a sort of universal acknowledgement that the United States role was absolutely key in making this process possible and sustaining it for while it lasted, uh, and that its loss of interest was detrimental to the process. So you need that outside leverage. On the other hand, delegates suggested that any future process should ensure greater regional buy-in to heighten the stakes of the regional parties and be tailored to the region as much as possible. So while there was a sort of understanding that sitting in, in these seminars and hearing about arms control experiences in other regions is to some extent useful. The Middle East is ultimately different and lessons learned from elsewhere are only instructive uh, up to a point. Perhaps I'll end here and I'm um, happy to take further questions. Thank you, Hannah, for highlighting some of the um, opportunities, challenges and lessons from the ACRES process. Before I introduce our distinguished discussant, Ambassador Adam Scheinman, let me invite our audience to get ready to participate in this discussion with comments and questions. You can do so in two ways. Our preferred way is for you to chime in directly. Uh, you do that by pressing the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality, and it'll put you into a queue and I'll call on you to unmute yourself and pose your comment or question or you can use the Q&A function in the Zoom functionality and I'll post the comment or question to our panelists. With that, um, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Adam Scheinman. We're very grateful to have him here today uh, to provide a contemporary policy perspective on the ACRES Working Group's process, utilizing his more than 30 years of experience in the field. In December of last year, Ambassador Scheinman resumed his role as special representative of the president for nuclear nonproliferation in the U.S. State Department, which he held earlier from 2014 to 2017 under President Barack Obama, before retaking this his uh, retaking his role as special representative. Um, he was a professor of practice at the Naval War College from 2017 to 2021. Ambassador Scheinman has spent his career in the field of nuclear policy and nonproliferation. After starting his career as a policy analyst for a number of NGOs focusing on arms control uh, and nonproliferation matters, he joined the Department of Energy as foreign affairs analyst in the Office of International Policy and Analysis Division. He held that post until 1991 before moving on to a number of different positions within the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, including the role of senior advisor to the, to the Assistant Secretary for Nonproliferation and National Security. In 2009, he began serving as Director for Nonproliferation on the White House NSC staff, overseeing all aspects of US multilateral nuclear policy. Then in 2013, he took a role as senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for International Security and Nonproliferation at the State Department before beginning his tenure as special representative under the Obama administration. Adding to his long list of accomplishments, Ambassador Scheinman has written a numerous scholarly articles, too many to discuss and list here now, lectured widely, participated in international conferences, we're very privileged to have you with us today, Ambassador Scheinman, and the Zoom room is yours. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Really happy to uh, join you all on, on the call. Uh, just one uh, minor correction in, in my uh, biographical note, it, which won't matter to anybody on, on this call, but it would matter a lot uh, to other uh, groups. I taught at the National War College, not at the Naval War College. So uh, just so we <laughs> I don't offend any of the, uh, the faculty. Uh, so again, really happy to be here. Uh, I have uh, long been a fan of, of the work of the uh, of CNS and uh, Christian, your own uh, nonproliferation history project there at the Wilson Center. I think you're all doing just uh, tremendous work, providing a, a great service both to practitioners and and non practitioners, academics, experts, and so forth uh, with respect to nuclear nonproliferation policy. Uh, also, would like to uh, recognize both Ken and and Hannah for their work, the team's work, and contributing to what I think is, you know, fairly limited um, available literature on the Acres talks and, and a process. It's a process that's, uh, you know, at risk of, of fading with age. Uh, it's not well understood uh, outside of a small community of, of scholars and, and maybe uh, diplomats, but uh, there's an important history there that I think remains uh, relevant and I'm glad you're able to, to capture it. Uh, so despite uh, the, I guess, the limitations and ultimately the inconclusive outcome from Acres, uh, I, I do think there are probably important lessons for policy and, and policymakers today. Uh, so again, I, I really appreciate you helping us to, to draw some of those lessons out. I think we've heard a number of really interesting uh, ideas that have um, come out in the presentations already. Now, I, I should say, I didn't work on the Acres process that predated me in, in my time in government. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I don't know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there was no one left in uh, US government who worked on, on Acres, uh, either directly or, or indirectly. And, and most of the experts I uh, suspect that you interviewed are probably uh, working on the outside now. Uh, I did, however, have very extensive involvement in the uh, 2010 NPT review conference and the decision to uh, convene, uh, attempt to convene an international conference on a regional WMD free zone and uh, worked quite a bit with the, uh, with the Finnish government and the uh, activities of Ambassador Jaco Leava to advance the Middle East zone concept in the run up to the 2015 review conference. And uh, you know, from that experience and, and my familiarity with the issues over the course of my career, uh, there are probably a, a number of points that I could make that bear on, on the past, the, the present, and in the future. Uh, one is that there can be no substitute for direct dialogue in building relationships and fostering creative solutions to very difficult security challenges. And I think we've heard a reflection of that in uh, the presentations already this morning. I think it's quite, uh, it should be obvious, maybe it's not obvious uh, to all, but that a regional zone or a regional security regime will only arise through a process that is both voluntary and evolutionary. It cannot be imposed on regional states and efforts to pressure nations to do things that they deem not to be in their direct national interest are almost uh, always doomed to fail. Outside parties can help, uh, they can facilitate, they can build bridges, they can uh, coax, they can cajole. But as, uh, as stated in the UN Disarmament Commission guidelines, which is about uh, the closest thing we have to canon with respect to uh, uh, WMD free zones or nuclear weapon free zones, those zones are only achievable if pursued on the basis of consensus and the participation of all states in the region. And that really has been how we've approached uh, this issue in the Middle East. So from my experience following the 2010 NPT review conference, uh, it was cl really clear, I would say, that the, the debates and the challenges that dominated Acres, as I understood it from those who participated uh, in it at the time, uh, including issues of inclusivity and consensus decision-making and sequencing and the relationship between arms control 
uh, and regional security or disarmament and, and regional security, all of that remained very much alive uh, well over two, two decades later. Uh, so that, that would be a, a first point. A second point is, as we've already heard, and I just wish to echo, I, I think there remains a very significant gap on the issue of ends and means for achieving a regional zone, uh, weapon-free zone, WMD-free zone, or uh, regional security kind of regime. Uh, and, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think Israel and, and the Arab states uh, for decades have viewed the problem very differently. Uh, one, as we've heard, Israel uh, views disarmament as the end and the end product of regional security and, and normalization of political relations, whereas the Arab states uh, have tended to argue that disarmament is needed as a first step in order to generate that type of security. It's the means to an end. And that gap has never been closed. Uh, I don't think it's closed uh, today. And, and efforts that, uh, that we uh, were helping uh, the Finns to uh, you know, reach a compromise on in the 2013 or 2014 uh, consultation period by agreeing to a conference agenda that covered both elements, security and disarmament, ultimately came to naught. Uh, that said, the you know, the experience of Acres and in the NPT during the prior review period, I, I think demonstrates that there is still much to discuss among regional states on security, whether that's discussion, uh, perception of, of threat, discussion of security policies and doctrines, uh, ongoing dangers of missile and WMD proliferation, problems of compliance, uh, the types of military competence building and related arms control steps that are, that are needed to provide security uh, for all states that are asked to participate in a zone arrangement all remain uh, very much relevant. Uh, a third point is that uh, it, you know, it goes without saying that the region, the Middle East is changing in very significant ways today. Uh, and that presents both uh, risks and, and opportunity. And I, I think the risks are largely structural uh, with shifts in the regional security landscape and uh, you know, some of these well understood security dilemmas that, that arise that lead to arms racing and military balancing uh, as the, the tools of choice to the exclusion of diplomatic solutions. And today's Middle East is, you know, it's hardly without its challenges. You know, Iran's nuclear progress is uh, well documented, uh, certainly no credible civilian purpose associated with its nuclear energy program. Uh, Syria is a user of chemical weapons, flouting its uh, international obligations. Uh, Russia's uh, very reckless nuclear behavior and, and rhetoric have put strains not only on the NPT and the nonproliferation structure, uh, but I think it's uh, likely being felt in the Middle East and, and beyond. Uh, China is increasingly feeling its power as a rising uh, strategic competitor and uh, you know, has gained some interest in, uh, in the Middle East. And perhaps most importantly, I think Iran's strategic aims appear more focused on, on regional dominance than uh, peace and stability. And in that environment, you know, it's reasonable to ask what, what is possible in terms of regional cooperation on arms control and security. Well, as, as I say, I, I think the changes in the region uh, uh, produce not only hazards, but uh, potentially opportunity. And that includes opportunities for uh, leadership of, of the United States and, and others. Uh, and for those who have read the president's national security strategy, you know that it commits us to a more integrated Middle East that empowers allies and partners to advance reg regional peace and prosperity. Uh, and uh, relies on diplomacy as a tool to de-escalate conflicts and, and reduce tensions. Now, in the realm of nonproliferation, uh, I think all on the call, like we know, we remain committed to the long-term goal of a WMD-free Middle East, and we're continuing to invest significant resources, financial, diplomatic, otherwise, in helping to build regional capacity to address WMD risks, uh, supporting the institutions that undergird the nonproliferation system, and uh, perhaps most important, promoting regional dialogue to build confidence and, and address challenges. Uh, we're also firmly committed to ensuring Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon, and, and we have been sincere in pursuing a diplomatic solution 
to that end through a return to the JCPOA. Now, as during the Acres period, uh, we're trying to advance greater regional integration between Israel and Arab and Muslim majority countries. Uh, it includes efforts to uh, encourage uh, further extension of the Abraham Accords and related activities, including the Negev Forum and the Negev Summit, which can, if nothing else, uh, provide a start for building a more robust architecture for regional integration. And together with uh, parallel efforts to work with the GCC on uh, regional approaches to, to golf security and the I2U2 uh, project, uh, you know, perhaps there's a basis for uh, creating conditions that uh, would allow for further uh, discussion and dialogue on uh, regional security and, and even arms control types of activities. I think you know, those, those efforts, which I, I'm not an expert on, I, I probably, uh, can't answer uh, any questions folks may have on the uh, particular elements of those uh, regional approaches, but uh, it would seem to me that they uh, you know, have the potential to change the face of the Middle East by advancing the kind of direct dialogue that's needed on shared uh, regional security challenges. And I think that that's another lesson from the Acres period. Although aborted, it serves, if nothing else, as a reminder of the benefits of, of direct engagement among states. Uh, but also the limits of what's politically achievable given prevailing security conditions. Uh, those conditions can deteriorate, meaning states are unlikely to take huge risks with their security, but you know, conditions can also change over time for the better, uh, as we saw in the early 1990s. And so the, the task, I think, of, of leaders and leadership is not just to react to the conditions uh, that we face, but also to try to shape them in ways that might lead to uh, greater security for all. So I'll uh, I'll close with that and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ambassador Scheinman, uh, for these um, excellent thoughts and comments. Um, uh, the floor is now open to uh, our audience's question and comments. Again, you can use the uh, Q&A function or the raise hand function in Zoom to join this conversation. Um, let me start off with a, a question by Tomisha Bino, uh, writing a question for Hannah, I think. Uh, you mentioned that there was a difference in perspective among stakeholders on the extent to which the talks contributed to trust building. What do you think, and perhaps some interviewees have spoken about this, would have uh, had to happen for the states of the region to view the exercise as more valuable for trust building. Thank you, Christian, and uh, hi to Misha, and thanks for the great question. Uh, it is a good question. Um, the sense from the interviews, I would say, is that um, whatever trust building didn't happen was not due to process design, let me put it this way. I mean, we tried to get uh, in the interviews at the question, well, whether uh, more regular meetings um, or, you know, longer meetings, when, whether any of that would have made a sort of material uh, difference to those meetings and, and the bridging of differences. But the feeling was very much that the, the meetings were quite regular, if you take into account both the plenaries as well as the intersessional activity, and that there was quite a lot of, of engagement. So it wasn't really due to that. Um, it was really the feeling that... Um, fundamentally those substantive divisions still remain. So meaning you can be an Egyptian diplomat and develop quite an amicable relationship with your Israeli counterpart, even friendly and, and sort of really get along. But at the end of the day, you still understand that your governments take quite different approaches uh, in this process and in what you're trying to negotiate and the trust building and the personal dimension, you know, cannot, cannot ultimately overcome this. Um, another thing I would say about the trust building was that uh, quite a few interviewees noted that when you had uh, more technical discussions, uh, specific discussions on confidence building in the operational basket, and you sort of got the politicians out of the room and had non-politicized discussions, that that was also greatly uh, conducive to the atmospherics when you sort of had the, 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 the naval officers, for instance, sitting down and discussing those maritime uh, CBM. So that, that, that was seen as very much conducive to, to trust building. But my, my, my broad answer to your question was, it wasn't 
really due to the process design, it was the broader po political divergences. There are a couple of questions about the Russian dimension of this. Um, uh, Violetta uh, Kabibolina writes, please explain uh, about the corpus of interviews with regard to Russian informants, Russian interlocutors, uh, if there were any, and uh, were, Rus were there Russian researchers uh, on your team? And perhaps uh, Hannah and, and uh, Ambassador Scheinman as well, and, and Hannah, of course, uh, uh, maybe you could talk for a moment about Russia's role in the Acres process and perhaps also today uh, in, 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 in the security process. I'm, I'm happy to start and, and say a few words about this and also about the interview. So um, one caveat that has to be stated about, about this collection of oral history interviews is that not all parties without reservation could be interviewed for this study. The Russian delegation is an exception. We did not interview Russians for the study. A, a number of Gulf and Maghreb delegations. Uh, we also simply had difficulty in reaching, though we had complete lists of individuals who participated 30 years uh, ago, um, we had difficulty in locating them, uh, reaching them. Uh, on the Russian delegation, I wanna say the following now, because I work on Russia and I followed sort of Russian efforts on regional security with their collective security concept for the Persian Gulf in recent years, but also their efforts for a WMD free zone in the UN uh, process. Uh, it was particularly of interest to me to get Russians on record for this oral history. We tried uh, in 2020 and 2021, when we conducted those interviews, we tried extensively to get Russian diplomats who participated in ACRES to speak with us for the purpose of the study. We reached out directly to the Russian foreign ministry. We use some of our partners that we have at CNS, whether that's uh, the peer center or others. I have contacts at the Russian International Affairs Council to try to get to those individuals who played a major role in ACRES. And we essentially ran into a couple of sort of stumbling blocks. Unfortunately, some of, of the leading individuals who, who participated on the Russian side have unfortunately passed away in recent years. Others are still in senior roles in the Russian foreign ministry, working other files and were therefore not available to speak with us. And then there were a number of Russian individuals who would say that they only participated marginally in the process. So they, you would find them on a list of one of the Moscow plenaries, for instance, but they then did not sort of participate throughout the process and therefore felt personally that they could only tangentially comment on acres and sort of didn't feel qualified to speak sort of more robustly about the process. So, but there was a real effort to get the Russian delegation on record. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. But yeah, there was a, a feeling among the other interviewees that uh, Russia played a uh, positive role in this process, that it was important to have the Russians as a co-gavel holder. And, and therefore, we really made the effort to get them included. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Ambassador Scheinman, if you could comment on how Russia's role today compares to that during the Acres process. Well, the, the question uh, led me to think not about uh, Russia's role today, which I think has become completely subsumed in their uh, unfortunate and illegal war in, in, uh, in Ukraine, but upon, but upon the experience of the 2015 review conference where we had been working uh, very closely with Russia as a uh, NPT depository state and a, a co-convener um, uh, assisting with the we had hoped to be would be the agreement on a on an agenda for an initial regional conference uh, by by 2015, uh, and there was a period of time uh, during that process that uh, Russia acted in in, in my estimation um, sensibly and and responsibly uh, as a uh, a country that could help build the bridges uh, between and among the parties uh, in order to reach a, a compromise formula uh, for the terms of the conference and perhaps for a, a conference agenda. Uh, and uh, that all uh, changed uh, quite dramatically in the middle of the NPT review conference. And uh, I, I still uh, don't know why. Perhaps you'll have to run another series of interviews and uh, another oral history on what went wrong in, in the 2015 context. But uh, it seems apparent that uh, at least the cynic in me believes that Russia saw and, and smelled out a, a political opportunity to either embarrass the United States or uh, isolate the United States at the conference and uh, almost summarily ended its cooperation with the U.S. 
in trying to work through uh, compromises on, on this international conference and uh, uh, posed a, a paper and a series of ideas that were clearly beyond uh, anything that they could have imagined the United States would accept. And at the end of the day, we were forced to uh, block the uh, block the conference uh, because of what we deemed to be an unfair and unworkable uh, set of arrangements on, on the Middle East. Uh, so I, I suspect that Russia then and uh, Russia today uh, tends to view these issues not from the position of a responsible stakeholder in the international order and a, a system of nonproliferation that's centered in the NPT, but from the standpoint of what uh, what is more convenient and what advantages its particular uh, national interests and, and geopolitical interests in the region. And uh, unfortunately, that's, I, I think, the Russia we're dealing with today, perhaps times uh, 10 or times uh, 100. So it, it may be some time before we know whether Russia will regain its senses and, and return to a more responsible position. Thank you. Um, let me uh, perhaps bring uh, Hen back into the conversation and ask her to comment a little bit on the uh, relevance of the ACRES process for the current WMD free zone um, discussions that are going on. We just had the third conference in New York. Could you uh, bring this, uh, you know, talk about the relevance um, and lessons and importance for uh, for this process? Hen. Sure. Um... And let me address one question that was uh, sent by email to me, so maybe others have not seen it. Um, the, the, the question was about the role of track one and a half in the negotiations. Um, so it, it, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, a question and very important one. And track one and a half actually has been uh, done a lot through Acres. Um, but um, at some uh, anecdote that, again, we received, for example, was a, a cure relatively early on uh, in the first informal meeting that uh, happened in La, La Jolla with, in California. And the U.S. was trying to bring the Arabs and Israeli for the first time to meet outside of the formal negotiations. And they really tried to keep both groups separate because they wanted to respect the, the fact that most countries in the region did not have direct relationship with Israel and were very concerned about it. And we actually got uh, one of the interviewees, the Arab interviewer said that really they worked hard to convince uh, the US to bring and to mix the groups together rather than to keep them separate. And really uh, what they said is that, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here, is that my God, and it just took off. So this is sort of some of the ideas of track one and a half is like where, um, where you break the barriers of where uh, countries might not be able to speak with each other directly. Track one and a half really brings that a flexibility and atmosphere of where you can actually make things work a little bit more informally and inform the process both on content as well as help the big the, build the connection. So this is just a one question that was asked uh, on the email. With regard to the question of uh, the Middle East weapon of mass destruction freeze on today and what are the lessons learned, um, I, I think, and Adam alluded to some of it, there are international circumstances right now that really make things a little bit more complicated, given the fact that the US and Russia are not cooperating on anything right now, um, given the war in uh, Ukraine. So this, this leadership uh, of the two, what were then the two superpowers does not exist right now. And really the, the investment of trying to find a vision for the region. Uh, on the other end, that puts on regional states more honest to try to find their own uh, solution and try to create their own processes, uh, which as positive as well as more uh, cautious uh, opportunities if, if that is possible. The regional circumstances, as Adam said, really are also more complicated right now, but also bring the opportunities. So for example, uh, for me, if there is no, for example, if there is no JCPOA, if the JCPOA cannot be reinstated, that means that the issue of nuclear hedging is become a little more uh, problematic in the region, uh, not only by Iran, but other countries possibly. So then the question is, are there other tools that we are looking at the zone as well as other regional processes can address those gaps that the JCPOA will create? And if, if they can, that means that some of those processes, especially the zone will have to adopt 
uh, obligations that are going beyond other nuclear countries zone. Are countries in the region are interested, capable of doing something like that? Uh, so this is a question more than answer, obviously, but I think uh, there are lessons. Also with regard to the format, um, as mentioned, uh, Acres uh, missed some central countries, but at that time, it was not possible by countries in the region to really involve them. The question here, given the fact that in the process that's happening right now in the UN, Israel is not part of it, is that what can be done in the process or in other parallel processes to engage Israel in a way that actually address their concerns so they will be interested and find uh, if it's useful to be engaged on arms control, regional security issues. Uh, another is the capacity building. And unfortunately, <clears throat> and this is also related to the informal process uh, format. Unfortunately, uh, when we're looking on the region today, I can say that much is not, not much has changed and developed on the capacity building uh, aspect. And a lot is still need to be done in order to enable a process that is informed and sustainable. Uh, and this is related somehow to the informal part of the, of the process in acres, but also today, uh, there are no records or no records were kept then. Uh, and one of the problem is that there is no learning process when you don't have uh, records that are being kept. And also uh, in the process that is today, all the, all the records are not public. And I think this is actually a good thing because that allows countries to really explore issues, understand them better and ask questions that are important in order for them to be able to freely negotiate. On the other end, by not creating a records of those negotiations, really, there is a learning process that really is almost every year being restarted. And the question is, can you create a body of knowledge and expertise in the region that really will continue those negotiations over the years and over, over meetings, rather than restarting every time, because that is not uh, very helpful for uh, both internally, for the people that negotiate, as well as outsider. Um, I will stop here, but there, I think there are several other uh, lessons that I can speak about later on. Great, thank you. Um, there's a, a wonderful question from Carmen Carmel about what a transformational moment for the region might look like. And I'd like to uh, put that question to Ambassador Scheinman. But before I do that, I'll give him a moment to think about it. Let me ask uh, uh, Hannah about, um, uh, about narratives, the narrative about why Acres floundered. Um, uh, is it one narrative? What are the different narratives there? If you could elaborate a little bit on, on, on your remarks earlier, and then we'll, we'll go to uh, what may be our final question about the, you know, uh, what a transformational moment for the region might look like for all of the uh, panelists. Hannah. Sure, Kristen. B before I do that, let me just sort of take the audience very quickly through the final steps that we saw in the ECOS process, sort of what actually transpired in terms of events. So what emerged from our interviews is it seems that by late 1994, the Egyptians had basically concluded that Israel would not seriously put the nuclear issue on the table. And Israeli attempts to address Egyptian concerns in 1994 and into 1995 were basically seen as too little too late from Cairo's point of view. Cairo was then preparing for the 1995 NPT review and extension conference to get international support for its position. So then later in 1995, you have a meeting in Amman, an expert meeting in the operational basket where the Egyptians were perceived as trying to sort of stymie progress. Then you have the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in November of that year, which took sort of the steam out of the bilateral process as a whole. And basically, as you are in 1996, after a year of trying to convince the Egyptians to return into Acres, uh, the US basically decided it would not pursue any further formal meetings in Acres until the political environment had changed. Now, from that, basically, two main narratives emerged, and I already pointed to those two fault lines, arms control versus regional security, and the bilaterals versus the multilaterals sort of on the other hand. So the first narrative says the problem was the dependence of the multilaterals on the bilaterals. The US put quote unquote shackles on acres from the beginning, given this persistent desire to not let acres move ahead of the bilateral process. And then that narrative attributes additional relevance to Rabin's assassination in 1995, which stymied the bilaterals, 
brought down the multilaterals uh, and within that acres. And then Netanyahu assuming power in 1996 sort of further undermined that whole process. That's sort of one narrative. A second one de-emphasizes that linkage between acres and the bilateral track, but really argues that acres was experiencing difficulties throughout and well before Rabin's assassination. And it was really due to Israel's reluctance throughout to discuss uh, nuclear arms control, which then became especially vexing to the Egyptians in the lead up to the NPT review and extension conference in 1995. And if you look at our interviews, there's a lot of individuals who sort of put forward a mixture of those two narratives. It's not sort of one or the other. You find that in some interviews and in other accounts, you've sort of found a, a mixture of those of those two accounts. But it, it also boils down to sort of one other essential question, which is the question whether uh, there was a view that Israel's reluctance to discuss nuclear arms control was perceived as fixed and static over time. It was never going to change or whether there was some dynamism in the Israeli position. And I would say that by and large, the Egyptians reflecting on acres today feel that um, Israel was never going to going to put that issue on the table. Whereas if you look into some of the American accounts, there's a bit, a bit, bit of a uh, bit more nuance in how they reflect on that. Thank you. So then to our, what I think will be our final question by Karim Karmel, who also was involved in the project from the very beginning, and in fact, allowed to, uh, uh, for it to happen. How do you predict a transformational moment for the region uh, would look like, to look like, and are we better off preparing for that moment or trying to prepare, to bring it about? Ambassador Scheinman and uh, um, Hannah and Ren, welcome to chime in as well, Ambassador. Yeah, you don't want to give me the, the last word on this, I, I can assure you. Uh, so when I, uh, it's a really interesting question. And I, I guess as a uh, student of, of history and, and sometimes a uh, uh, teacher, uh, I don't think we see many transformational moments in history uh, that don't follow tragedy. Uh, you know, the Congress of, of Vienna and the hundred year history in, uh, of peace, relative uh, peace, absence of major power war in Europe followed the, the uh, devastations of uh, uh, Napoleon's wars. Uh, the end of the Cold War uh, didn't end in violence, thank God, but uh, it did end uh, because of the collapse of one of the uh, primary geopolitical players. Uh, and, you know, if I think about, you know, what might lead to trans transformational moments in the, in the Middle East, uh, you know, my mind, unfortunately, goes to uh, conditions of, of war, use of uh, WMD in a, a regional conflict or, or worse. So it, it's hard to imagine uh, some sort of shock to the, to the system uh, that might lead to the outbreak of, of peace and negotiations among the regional states. Uh, and since we're in, I think, a, a very uh, fragile moment in, in the Middle East and, and globally, for that matter, uh, I think we need to be a, a, a little bit in our, our predictions, uh, deal with the conditions that were faced principally in the Middle East. Uh, as Ken had, had stated, you have uh, uh, Iran and its nuclear program and uh, you know, what that might mean for hedging and, and latency among other states in the region uh, to counter Iran, uh, you know, none of that might lead you to believe that we could uh, restart the acres process in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, absent uh, some sort of, um, you know, tragic moment or, uh, you know, a set of conditions that might mimic where we were uh, at the Madrid peace process, which perhaps was, uh, just a, a convergence at a particular moment in history, uh, both in terms of the, the national uh, players in the region, uh, the political will that uh, they were prepared to exert to uh, pursue peaceful arrangements. Uh, you know, absent that kind of uh, uh, unique moment in history, I, I think the best we can do is to continue to press for uh, uh, you know, laying the conditions that might lead to progress down the road. And that's why I'm, I'm actually very encouraged by some of the 
uh, the, the, the uh, follow up and, and follow through from the Abraham Accords and efforts to promote greater regional integration, uh, regional defense uh, and security cooperation among states that uh, among whom it would have been unthinkable uh, even 20 years ago, uh, continuing to build capacity uh, for WMD controls in the region. All of that I think is essential uh, for the time that we're that we're living in. Maybe we'll get lucky and, and we'll face a, a transformational moment where uh, major negotiations on regional treaties is possible. Uh, you know, there, there could be worse outcomes uh, as well that I think we'd have to uh, prepare against. So, um, you know, I, I'm sad to say, uh, although it's, it's kind of the um, uh, mantra for, for work in this field that uh, muddling through is, is sometimes the, the best we can do. Thank you. Uh, Ren, Hanna, any final thoughts? Uh, sure. So while I'm not sure the, I would, or let's say I'm optimistic because I'm working in the Middle East and I don't think you can not be optimistic if you work on the Middle East. So I'm a little bit more optimistic than Adam in the sense of, I'm not sure we need to see a war um, or uh, a disaster for countries in the region to understand that we are really bad situation in the region that can turn really worse, uh, especially, as I said, um, because of this various aspects that are going on right now in the region with uh, perceived a real US rebalancing out of the region, Russia is not anymore um, or is not in a position anymore to be the supplier of some of the weapons that they have been uh, supplying before. Uh, and then with the collapse or, or not reinstating the JCPOA, Countries in the region have been reading that map. They have been reading that map for the last, I would say, seven, eight years. Uh, and what we see right now is both on one hand, conventional as well as probably hedging, uh, adoption, conventional uh, weapons acquisition and adoption probably of more and more hedging capacity. But also we see regional states start looking for ways to address their own problems by themselves in a way that is more cooperative. So if we look on the... Uh, not only the Abraham Accords and the NATO Forum, but also on the uh, Iranian uh, UAE, Iranian Saudi negotiations. If we see the recent uh, Lebanese Israeli demarcation, uh, maritime demarcation agreement, if we look on those, we really see, and, and the Qatari reconcil reconciliation, we really see uh, starting of attempts to, by regional countries to try to figure out if there are ways that they can directly negotiate with each other to address some of those long um, conflicts. And so I'm a little bit less uh, pessimistic that that cannot really crystallize some aspects of like, we really uh, cannot afford threshold country, many thresholds country in the region because it will bring to even more instability. So my hope is that there is some realization that in addition to the arms control that are going on right now, or that is not as extensive as it's going on or expensive as it's going on right now, there will be the regional security processes to complement each other and to start inform each other on what's possible and what we're trying to avoid in the region. Thank you. Hannah, any final words? Otherwise, very good. We're well over our time, so let me just thank Ambassador Scheinman, uh, Ken, Hannah, uh, for a fantastic panel. Let me thank my team, Kian Byrne and Trent Burgess at the Wilson Center for, for, for this. Thank you all in the audience. Again, the documents, the report, the oral histories and the critical oral history transcript all are freely and easily access accessible at digitalarchive.org. That's the Wilson Center's digital archive. With that, thank you all. Be safe. Take care. Good night or a good, good day.